Okay, so welcome again, everybody, back to the survey. We are at section seven, um, pandemic experience of musicians. So we had uh, 110 musicians taking the survey. This section examines the feelings and experiences of musicians during the pandemic in regards to the quarantine. So um, loss of performances, income, creativity, and unemployment. And uh, just to review the uh, previous data from the, the income section at the beginning of the survey, uh, one key piece of data was that 60% of musicians re reported receiving unemployment benefits during the income, I mean, during the pandemic. Um, and 35% of musicians reported not even applying to get unemployment benefits during the pandemic. Um, so that sort of implies a uh possibly disenfranchised community that is so you know tired of not or knew that they weren't able to uh how do you say um to apply for the paperwork to to qualify for unemployment benefits even though we are laborers um and we have to achieve at least 10,000 hours of unpaid practice labor just to you know be able to play our instrument in addition to all the other stresses of being musicians. So, um, so 35% did not even apply for unemployment, 60% received unemployment. And then of the people who received it, um, some people, you know, dealt with anxiety or fear of, uh, uh, deportation, for example, if they were not a citizen, um, and issues of 1099, uh, being able to like qualify and report uh, their taxes, right? So that's a whole other, you know, another issue of unpaid labor that we have to do is just taxes, right? Which is very hard in this country. And when I worked and lived in Kuwait, I learned the stark contrast of a country that does not tax its citizens and a completely different setup where nobody has to spend, you know, many hours and hours of dealing with the IRS and the income tax system of America. Like, so that's just something that's unique here that we don't even realize that, you know, maybe it could be a different way. Um, but that's something that occurred to me when I was overseas and it, I just started to look at everything in a, in like a different kind of um, lens. So, um, you know, for better or worse, but um, uh, okay. All right. So here we go. <laughs> so uh, so this first question, um, and again, this was conducted uh, between June 2021 until September 2021. And so people took their survey and this is the overall uh, breakdown. So question 33, in the past 15 months, how often have you felt like discontinuing work as a professional musician, uh, e.g. finding another pr profession or income avenue? Um, and so, uh, you know, I wanted to ask this question because I was noticing a lot of musicians right after 2020 and, and you know, into 2021, a lot, I was noticing a lot of musicians and friends, um, you, you know, transitioning into other careers and wanting stability. And um, maybe that's, you know, my age group also. Um, but so I wanted to survey. And so here's a breakdown. And uh so we have 30% said never, I mean, or almost 30, we've got what 28% here said never, 23% um, said rarely, 22% or 21% sometimes, 17% uh, often and 11% always. So, uh, you know, I don't have any previous data to compare it to, but uh, this is just sort of a benchmark. Um, and uh, you know, I'm curious how people felt at that time if they wanted to, uh, you know, change or if they already had like a different uh, avenue of income or if they noticed other people, um, uh, sort of departing full time music more often than before the pandemic. Um, okay, so uh, thirty four. How many times musicians played or performed in person from March 2020 until 2021? Uh, not including live streams. Um, and so we had uh, almost 30% here saying they they didn't perform at all. 
from March 2020 to 2021. And keep in mind, this was taken in mid 2021. So that's about a year and a half of not performing at all. Where as prior to the pandemic, you know, uh, musicians had their sort of prior frequency of playing. Um, and here we have a the the majority uh, median forty four percent said that they uh, performed between one to five times. So people were, you know, uh, maybe a handful of times here. Nine uh, percent said six to ten times. Ten percent said eleven to twenty times. And then we did have a seven uh, percent uh, eight. Participants reported saying they performed more than 20 times during this time period. Um, so yeah, you know, we still have some activity and it's good to just kind of see what the breakdown of how that activity was as like a snapshot. Um, and I'm curious how many times you all played during that time period. I think myself, I played the first gig August, 2021 on an outdoor stoop in Prospect Heights led by some friends of mine. Um, who just started a community jam session outside. And, you know, I showed up with my pandemic keyboard that was battery operated and started playing with Amanda Rutza on bass and Viva De Concini on guitar. And Jessica Lurie showed up and just like, I remember her bringing her horn out and she was playing this crazy, crazy, amazing stuff. And I was, I, I was like, so like, I had forgotten how to gig, you know, I had like left my like, you know, batteries at home, like and I, I, I only get the batteries and I was like, oh God, the jam is happening. And I remember like hearing Jessica Hillary and getting so excited and then like, oh no. And then I had to run home and get the batteries and then like put them in the keyboard, you know, and it was just like all these muscles, like completely, you know, that used to be so like flexed and strong were just like totally out the window. And I was like in shock, like deer in headlights, like, I can't believe this is something that I like forgot how to do and used to like you know, be really sort of greased and oiled to do. And like, suddenly I was completely, it's like felt like a fish out of water. Um, but I, yeah. And I remember my like excitement spiking, like the minute, like Jessica started playing and yeah, I don't know. So, so yeah, I think it was like a solid like year and a half that I didn't play. And that was the first time I was playing again with people. So, um, yeah, so here is question 35, longest gap in months of not playing music with others since March 2020. Um, so I guess I'm, I myself am in the like 10 months or more camp over here, which is most people. And then you can kind of see here the breakdown uh, was like some people did not stop playing at all. Um, and so we have 10% over here uh, continued playing. Uh, and this may be based on qualitative data and in interviews, maybe because they weren't in New York, for example, or they were in warmer states, like, for example, Texas or the South, where you're outdoors more often and you're still able to uh, play outside safely, um, social distancing, or maybe you're, you know, in parts of, you know, uh, the country where like masking was not really a concern or people weren't thinking about it at all. Um, so uh, that's kind of how I kind of understand this data from the other interviews and the qualitative data. Um, uh, 4% here almost reported about one month off. 12% uh, said two months off. 15% said three months off. Uh, 12, uh, 10, sorry, 11% said uh, four months off in the pandemic and then returned uh, or rather just closed the gap. Um, and then, uh, or or the longest gap entirely. So it may not have started in March, but for most people it started in March um, and so forth. So you can kind of see the breakdown. And I think it's weird because for some reason, 10 months is the magic number. Like most people are reporting on uh, 10 months here at 20%, but only 3% of people reported at nine months being the longest gap since the in the pandemic of not playing with other musicians um so yeah does this make sense are there any questions on this does anyone want to share how long did you not play with other people in the pandemic and how you felt what was going on there without uh, Brit 
for I'm trying to remember we, the, the survey the survey was New, New York City, right? Yes. So for yeah, players so that's yeah. Yeah. But there yeah. were people who left New York City. Right. Though they were based in New York City. So that like I know so that included New York City musicians who may have left and come back. Or left and stayed or it, the survey was just uh the target was people based in New York City or have had a, a significant portion of their career in music in New York City. So it, it does extend and include, but the, the primary base is New York. Um, yeah, any other thoughts? So any thoughts on this? Does anyone care to share? We can, you know, discuss after too. Well, I think I would have been in that um, in the 22 in the 10 10 month thing for for live music. But I remember thinking in the first three months of lockdown that I was actually playing more music online than I had been before lockdown. I mean, there were days when I was playing three different sessions all on Zoom. So um, but in terms of live stuff, yeah, it was it, it took a long time. Wow. wow. So you were playing sessions on Zoom, Miguel? I was playing way more music in general um, during lockdown, during the first three or four months of lockdown than I had like the year before lockdown. Wow. Because it, it, it was so, it was so new. And so a, a lot of people were, 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 were doing it and, and reaching out to other people to just, just to connect. Um, so yeah, that was really, but then it sort of died out. And I I would not play music on Zoom right now if even if I was paid a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, latency is pretty rough. <laughs> a friend of mine called Zoom Zoom sessions smear core. Smear core. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's because the rhythm was all smeared around and it was ah. Uh... <laughs> nice one um okay cool uh thank you miguel let's see uh anybody else want to share about longest gap of not playing music or playing music in the pandemic it's interesting because i noticed some people started using um low latency software and then some people like one person even like coded a you know a whole app to make like low latency jam sessions better and a couple companies popped up with that and you know it's interesting too um and i myself have like gotten into doing low latency software sessions with people you know all over and i think it's fun to be able to play from home and but it's also nice like i had a back injury so it allowed me to like play from home and you know not have to schlep gear um so that was nice um all right maybe i'll keep going here Okay, so uh, this one actually, oh, this is a great, uh, great question here. Um, so this one was a multiple um, checkbox. Uh, uh, so there were all these categories and people could check the top three uh, hardships uh, uh, maximum. So maximum of three choices. And so the question is, which were the biggest hardships for you as a professional creative musician during the pandemic? And out of 110 responses, people picked the top three. So the top one at 40% was mental sanity, depression, and anxiety. Um, the let's see, second bigger biggest one here is absence or loss of positive emotions uh, playing music um, at 31% uh, here. And actually, I might have a better graphic than this one. No, okay. Um, all right, so I'll continue. So we have 30% uh, said missing hearing and playing uh, uh, other with other musicians. 34% um, here said feeling detached from meaning. So sort of literally meaninglessness. Um, so those are the top four here. And then other reasons here, large reasons were isolation and isolation and quarantine. Um, 
absence or loss of experiencing uh, social relationships. And uh, here we have missing hanging out with your musician friends um, and loss of sense of accomplishment here at 24%, almost 25% here. Um, about 7% here said access to childcare uh, was a top hardship. 13% um, said financial hardship was the top hardship. And then over here, we have these various categories that, uh, you know, others checked off here, such as lack of creativity, um, anxiety about not accomplishing anything, uh, loss of confidence, uh, alcohol addiction, uh, family problems, and erased sense of self and identity. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the question of identity is a large one for musicians in the pandemic from, from you know, all of the data in general. Um, and then we have a couple other boxes where people entered like their own personal reasons of what were the biggest hardships. And, and this is the qualitative data here. So one person entered something, a couple things in here, but I'd have to go into the data set to actually get the full quote. Um, but I'd go, um, I'm going to go on here. So the, so 36A, top hardships of the pandemic. So mental sanity. Uh, here we go with the qualitative data. Um, so yeah, 40% uh, chose this at, as a top hardship. Um, but then again, 60% did not check mental sanity as a top hardship. So, so actually, you know, it kind of does say that it wasn't the biggest thing for every, the majority didn't check that box, but 40% did check that box. And that was the most frequently checked box as the top hardship of the pandemic. So um, yeah, um, and let's see, here we go. Uh, oh, qualitative data. Yeah, so kind of touched on a few of the options, but just to make it super clear, I had a really hard time staying focused in my practice doing, due, due to the lack of improvising with other people. So because we couldn't play with other people, um, people couldn't focus on playing alone, which I think is interesting, you know. Um, and I almost kind of think about this like a, like an energetic effect fact if we're all isolated then we're not connected and that has that impact on us individually um and just like i think when we're all together in a yoga class if one person wobbles then the rest of the people start wobbling and it's kind of like a an energetic effect i don't know if you've ever been in a yoga class but that's like a it's a total thing that happens um because it's just like the uncertainty sort of passes around and even if you feel really solid in your pose like there's just something about like other people wobbling that makes you feel less steady uh so yeah um and actually there's in the music psychology uh master's course one of the first studies we did was on uh dancing and somatic movement and uh a study that music and dancing promote social bonding um and this is kind of a uh, yeah, I don't know. I think about this a lot. So, um, okay, I'll keep going here. So 37, how do you feel about returning to live performances in the public after times? I mean, in the after times. So, so this was asking musicians um, how they felt about going back to uh, gigging after, quote unquote, after the pandemic, even though like COVID is still happening and will probably always be here. Um, uh, so yeah, I designed this question. Um, and this kind of reminds me of, uh, there was a meme going around, uh, I think in like 2021, uh, when the vaccine came out that, um, it was like a cat, uh, like content in a little like corner behind a window and a bookshelf. And, and then it, it, with the caption reading, um, uh, people working from home, and then uh, wearing sweatpants. And then there was a picture of like the cat being dragged out, like clawing and trying to not like be taken <laughs> away from this corner. And then the caption read like people um, at home, like wearing sweatpants, like now that the vaccine has been rolled out and nobody wants to go back to work in person. 
And the cat's just like, no, like, don't take me back to work. So I kind of designed this with that in mind. Um, if musicians did not want to go back to live performing, um, coupled with the sort of mass exodus of people from New York and musicians from New York, and then also, um, you know, just maybe burnout and anxiety, et cetera, if people did not want to go back to, right, performing. So, so we're asking musicians, how did you feel about returning to performing after the vaccine? And uh, most people said they felt positive about it. So uh, that was good news. Uh, we have 34% here. Um, 30, 29% said positive. Uh, so not entirely like jumping out of their chairs, ready to go back to playing gigs, but, you know, pretty excited. 28% um, were neutral on it. And then 9% were somewhat negative. So over here in the 9% category are the cats, like clawing and <laughs> not wanting to leave, not wanting to, you know, the people, like the people at home in sweatpants and not wanting to go back to their commute to their jobs. So uh, so <laughs> got about 9% there. So that's kind of how I break this one down here. Um, okay. All right, so next one. How do you generally feel about performing virtual live streams? Um, so it's funny because like I, I actually enjoy doing um, uh, improvised live streams using low latency software. And um, Miguel, I respect the, uh, that, the fact that you spent the early portion of the pandemic doing uh, Zoom uh, zoom sessions and and you did a lot more music on zoom in the early part of the pandemic than um i don't know like i, I yeah that's new to me um that's exciting uh i did i yeah i i suffer on zoom and the latency issue is quite a thing and you know so when i i got onto the low latency software train it it was much more exciting um but this was taken in 2021 and um, well before I discovered how to use latency software. Um, and we have here uh, most people like uh, number one in the strongly negative category uh, over here. We've got 22% of people really, really thumbs down about performing virtual live streams. Um, and 35% here uh, negative. Uh, view of virtual live streams. So most people are really not into the virtual live streams. 20% um, uh, have a neutral attitude on virtual live streams. Um, I think at the time I probably would have been in the neutral zone and I didn't uh, discover low latency software and now I really love it. Um, but yeah, I think at the time not knowing about this, I, I probably would have been somewhere between here and I would have just been like, maybe casually going on to like Instagram and doing a willy nilly live stream just to like connect with people at random just for funsies. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of interesting here. And then here we have like 15% about uh, having a positive uh, vibe about performing uh, live streams and then a small 7% like really actually positive about live streams. So uh, yeah, I think that's interesting there. Um, but of course, this was in 2021. So it's really kind of early part of the pandemic. And I think I'm sure people would maybe feel differently now. Um, and maybe, yeah, everybody has a different experience. So I think it's like weird. We're kind of in the, I don't know, next century now. And, you know, all, all these things are possible. Um, you know, and it seems like everybody wants to be a YouTuber or something, you know, to, that's like the maximum freedom of I don't know, remote work, but that's like a particular weird grind where you're doing a personal brand or something. So anyway, I'm on a tangent, but I'll keep going here. So 39, here we go. How has the pandemic affected your overall desire to make music? And uh, right, like this is kind of a crazy question, right? Um, so here uh, we have kind of neutral, no change. Um, people more often than not feel about the same. They still want to uh, perform music overall and their desire hasn't changed. So that's about 40% here. Um, but 
that means that we do have 60% of people did have a change, um, but actually it looks more positive. So it, it does increase here. It's more on the somewhat increased or strongly increased um, uh, areas. So, right, 27% said somewhat increased. They have more desire to make music than before the pandemic. And 15% here uh, say strongly increased. So they feel much more uh, uh, interested in having desire to make music. And then over here we have about, uh, what is this? I guess 18 percent uh, have less of a desire to make music. So personally, I, I would be in the less uh, desire to make music, but that's probably just me. Um, I think I had really burned myself out just before the pandemic happened with a tour that took me like nine months of stress to coordinate and manage all by myself and a record release and, you know, the, the cost of that. So Personally, I was in the decreased zone uh, after the pandemic hit. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are and how, how you all felt on whether your desire was increased or not. Um, okay, and last, here we go. This is the last question of the entire survey. Uh, that is the quantitative portion. Um, I can't believe we, make it, we made it here. It took four weeks. Uh, so question number 40, how did the pandemic and or unemployment benefits allow you to make progress on your original music compared to the before times? Okay, so my intention with this question was to understand uh, and elaborate on the qualitative data and interviews of musicians and observing what people were experiencing around me in New York and seeing musicians um, unable to work, but 60% qualified for unemployment benefits. So they did have some more uh, support in, in sense of being able to have stability and many for possibly the first time of having a stable paycheck ever because it by receiving unemployment benefits, it seemed the average amount of unemployment benefits that people received was somewhere between 90 to $180 a week. Um, and having that seemed to, uh, if you qualified and if you applied in the 60% of people that applied and received unemployment benefits, um, a lot of people reported feeling uh, more stable, more secure. Um, some people were able to save money and some people were able to use that money to release more music. Um, and uh, some people uh, reported that the pandemic was the time that they had the most money than ever before because they uh, had this stable support uh, from unemployment benefits. Uh, but, you know, and some people, uh, were able to refocus their creative work in some sense, uh, and others were uh, able to maybe be a little bit less stressed and then therefore focus more on, on their creativity. So in that sense, uh, there was a positive impact uh, from unemployment benefits. And I think that's reflected here in the data. So um, we have like a small number of people here are saying that it totally prevented them from making progress on their original music, uh, right? 4% say, say, said that the, <laughs> not speak, 4% said that the pandemic completely prevented them from making progress on their original music. Um, but as, as, as the, you know, Likert scale goes on uh, to completely prevented, often prevented, slightly prevented, uh, up here, we can see there's like much larger numbers in the turnout that uh, it enabled their original music and enabled creativity. And over here, uh, enabled musicians uh, completely to get more self-funded original creative work done. So that's 21% over here. Um, and uh, in the middle here, uh, the, the, the uh, median here is 27% uh, said no difference. So 24% um, it's slight, slightly enabled and then 15% said often and again. So there you have it. Uh, yeah, so overall there's an implication that there's uh, more support 
uh, from the pandemic and unemployment. And I wonder if that, you know, might be because uh, people had a bit more support and stability. And obviously, I think this implies that if musicians had, uh, y you know, were, were actually paid just to be musicians, they could actually get more work done. Um, and we would have, uh, I think, better, healthier musicians. And obviously, that brings me to the conclusion of uh, the quantitative data that uh, implications for tech, government, corporate, and nonprofit sectors and legislation are that if we, uh, you know, my, my position from synthesizing this data, and I'm sure you all would feel, you know, similar, is that if musicians were paid and uh, uh, recognized uh, by the government as legitimate laborers, um, and even culturally in cultural attitudes, uh, recognized socially as laborers um, and deserving of ticket sales uh, direct to the artist and, you know, against the landscape where everything taxes the artist, right? So the artist has to pay to make the work and sell the work and promote the work, you know, via all these platforms. And it's the, the contest of popularity to get to the you know, uh, largest amount of people to, you know, market and sell. And we live in this, you know, hype pop culture because it's ticket sales, right? Is the majority 54% share of the market. So mm -hmm. again, um, you know, a couple ideas I have about, yeah, I have more ideas about like posing problems to legislation. And then I have had experience for the past couple of years with working with the Music Workers Alliance and um, Mark Rebo and Jerome Harris and um, John Medeski's on the steering committee and a, a lot of other people um, to, to try to get legislative change. And we had some successes here and there, but it's also really hard to do advocacy work, especially changing things for like the union. And anyway, I have more thoughts on, on you know, advocacy and reform. So um, but anyway, let me open it up and uh, thank you for coming to my TED Talk once again. Um, and uh, here, let me open it up and I will stop the recording and then, yeah, we can discuss here.